This is a quick video on inguinal and femoral hernias. I'll be discussing the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations for these types of hernias. As in all of these videos, the color coding for each of the boxes is listed up here in the top right, and I'll be clearing each of the boxes and repopulating the flowchart one by one as we talk about each concept. In addition, in this video, I'm going to leave up this anatomic reference for the sites of these hernias. You could see the inguinal triangle, also known as Hesselbach's triangle, is indicated by this shape and color here, as well as the inguinal, or as well as the femoral canal, which is um, shown right here. These are the three hernias that we'll be discussing. The direct inguinal hernia that passes through Hesselbach's triangle, the indirect inguinal hernia that passes outside of Hesselbach's triangle, and the femoral hernia, which passes through the femoral canal. So. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with the definition of these hernias. These hernias are a protrusion of abdominal contents through a specific structure. Now the abdominal contents can include intraperitoneal fat, mesentery, and or bowels. And when they go through a specific structure, we designate them according to where they are protruding through. For instance, if the abdominal contents are protruding medial to the inferior epigastric blood vessels within Hesselbach's triangle and lateral to the rectus abdominis, it's a direct inguinal hernia. So let's try to orient ourselves here. If it's inguinal to the inferior epigastric vessels, these are the, in, the inferior ep epigastric vessels, and medial is in this direction, and then lateral to the rectus abdominis, the rectus abdominis muscle is here, this would be called a direct inguinal hernia. Next, if they're lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels, so now we're on this side of the inferior epigastric vessels, outside of Hesselbach's triangle, it's an, inguinal, it's an indirect inguinal hernia. Lastly, if they go through the femoral canal and through the femoral ring, it's a femoral hernia, as shown right here. Now it's worth thinking through the etiology of each of these hernias to help you differentiate them. And you might be able to differentiate them based on your patient population and risk factors. So first, let's start with the direct inguinal hernia. This typically happens in older men, and it's usually an acquired problem. So usually the older men aren't born with it. It's something they acquire over life. It's caused by a weakening of the transversalis fascia. Now this can happen for a couple reasons. First, you can have increased intra-abdominal pressure. This can result from conditions like constipation, where you have high pressure in the abdomen, or COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, with a chronic cough, where you're constantly increasing your intra-abdominal pressure as you cough. Both of those things can increase your pressure and weaken your transversalis fascia. In addition, you can just have a weaker transversalis fascia structurally. So you could have weaker skeletal muscle and connective tissue that makes up your transversalis fascia. This most commonly arises from corticosteroid use. So long-term steroid use can cause weakness of those structures and to also predispose you to a direct inguinal hernia. Next, let's look at the etiology of the indirect inguinal hernia. This typically happens in older men as well, but also young male infants. Now, this is typically a congenital disorder as opposed to the acquired disorder of the direct inguinal hernia. Now, it, even though it's a congenital disorder, it might not become apparent until these people reach adulthood, even though it might be present since birth. Now, this happens when you have incomplete obliteration of the processus vaginalis. And that's a lot of words here. Let's think about what the processus vaginalis is. It's an outpouching of the parietal peritoneum that extends through the inguinal canal. So normally you have this peritoneum that goes through the inguinal canal, and it's normally obliterated by birth. When it's not obliterated by birth, it can result in an indirect hernia, either at birth or later in life. Lastly, let's look at the femoral hernia. This happens in female, typically as they get older with advancing age. It's, uh, there's a couple of risk factors that are worth knowing here. One is multiparity. That's if the female has had multiple babies throughout her reproductive years. Previous abdominal surgery predisposes you to this. So prior hernias can require a surgery and sometimes that surgery itself can predispose you to having femoral hernia. This one's also caused by increased intra-abdominal pressure as well. So a lot of the same things as the direct inguinal hernia will apply here as well. So COPD plus cough, as we said earlier, 
constipation, obesity can also increase your intra-abdominal pressure, and straining for micturition or straining to pee can also increase your intra-abdominal pressure. So we said that this is more common in females, but it also happens in men. One predisposing factor in men is BPH. So if you have BPH in men, you have a structural blocking of your urethra, which requires you to strain to urinate, which can increase your intra-abdominal pressure and cause that femoral hernia. Now let's look at the manifestations for these hernias. We'll start with the least my, uh, severe to the most severe. So in the least severe of cases, you have a mass or a swelling in the respective region. And that mass and swelling is typically reducible and soft. This is called an uncomplicated hernia, and it usually doesn't cause problems. The little mass, the little swelling usually enlarges as you strain or cough or do a Valsalva maneuver, such as when you try to go to the toilet. And it's usually smaller when you lay on your back, when you lay supine. Now in more severe cases, the abdominal contents can become trapped in the hernia sac. When this happens, you can have an irreducible hernia. This means that the hernia cannot be pushed back into the abdominal cavity, but the overlying skin of the hernia is still normal. So an irreducible hernia with overlying skin that is normal is also called an incarcerated hernia. Now this overlying skin being normal can get worse. In the more severe case, you can have restriction of blood supply due to the contents being trapped in the hernia sac. This can lead to ischemia and or necrosis. In this case, the hernia can become irreducible with severe sudden groin pain, maybe bowel obstruction, and the overlying skin can become abnormal. The skin can be warm, red, tender. It can also have an exfoliated or blistered appearance. This is called a strangulated hernia, and it's a surgical emergency. These patients need to be operated on to reduce their hernias and hopefully save their bowel that's being strangulated. I hope this review of inguinal and femoral hernias has been helpful. Thank you for listening.